Need help? Call our cybersecurity team and book a consultation with us today. So tonight we are going to cover Cisco Umbrella. Our speaker is Michael Kim. He's the uh, head security architect at my company, LA Networks, actually. And he's just going to cover kind of the basics of Umbrella. And then I think, Michael, you were trying to get a demo up and running. I don't know. Yep. Were you successful? Okay, perfect. So we'll also do a little bit of a demo so you can kind of see the console, some of the capabilities. You know, Umbrella is one of those interesting products that when it was first acquired, it was kind of a niche do one thing, which was DNS security. And now it does many things and it's the backbone of things like the SASE solution for Cisco, for example, or maybe I can't say the backbone, but one of the very core components along with things like the AnyConnect client. So, um, for those who may be re-watching this, just so you know, we have a small group this month because there's a, we're having some issues with WebEx and a lot of people are having a hard time connect, connecting. So we're going to go ahead and record and we'll put it up on all the usual places like our YouTube channel. Um, uh, Robert and I have, are going to be doing some planning soon to come up with some of the rest of the topics for the rest of the year. So I'm not sure what we'll cover next month um, but we'll figure something out, uh, hopefully maybe tomorrow or next week. That being said, thanks for those who were able to connect. I do appreciate it. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Michael. All right. Okay. So let me just, uh, share my screen. And, uh, let me just start this off. And then uh, feel free to kind of uh, ask questions. I don't mind interruptions. This is kind of more of a more informal Q&A type presentation anyway. So I'd actually welcome questions if you guys have any. So um, starting off with some of the kind of the, uh, the introductions. Uh, my name is Michael Kim. I am with LA Networks. Uh, I work with Jason um, in the security department. Uh, so we were founded in 1997. Uh, we are started, managed, and led by engineers, known and recognized for our engineering. And then uh, these are our main core verticals. Uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard this before, so I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly. So we can get to the actual kind of meat of the presentation, which is on Cisco Umbrella. So this initial portion is kind of based off of an old presentation I gave. And then there's some kind of updated information because uh, in the last just few years, Cisco Umbrella has changed a lot, like dramatically from what it kind of was uh, just like two, three years back. So this is kind of how it started off. And I'm going to go into kind of how it's changed uh, since the kind of the landscape of, of work and how people are, are working has changed. All right, just uh, just agenda. This is uh, just going to be the main presentation, and then hopefully we'll have time to kind of go into the uh, the demo. Uh, we're kind of show you at least the dashboard, how some of the things work, uh, how users and branches are able to connect and use Umbrella for for security. All right, so uh, the challenge facing kind of corporations and companies today. Um, the first challenge is nothing new. Implementing network security products has always been difficult. Um, they always tend to either go in front of uh, your network or have to be installed on every single endpoint. So just deployment in general for anything security-wise is very difficult. Um, today's mobile workforce needs on-network and off-network protection. So that has kind of uh, gotten a lot more dramatic as more people do uh, remote work, work from home. Uh, maybe they have like a, a home office as, as companies kind of branch out and build more branch offices, but they still need to have uh, as much protection at a branch or at home uh, or like a worker in the Starbucks on a laptop that they do when they're actually inside their, their corporate office. Okay, and then the third uh, challenge is many companies require 
uh, some sort of web filtering, proxying, uh, some content filtering, just as uh, for general, uh, either security or HR or things like that. Uh, but these are all kinds of solutions that in the past, at least was uh, kind of difficult to implement. You'd have to put in a box that you'd proxy all your proxy, all your web traffic to that would do all your content filtering before passing it out to your actual firewall. Um, there are like firewalls now that will do content filtering and uh, can also work as a proxy, but sometimes even then they tend to have latency or, or slow down uh, people's access to the internet. So there was kind of a lot of things that, that made uh, those types of um, things difficult to, to implement and get people to kind of uh, buy in and accept. Okay, so, so what is Umbrella? So Umbrella is uh, the newer name for uh, what was once called OpenDNS. Uh, so OpenDNS started off as a DNS provider. Um, from there, they kind of uh, started getting more into security and they started doing web content filtering. Um, and what they do, what they allow you to do is to filter and block DNS requests to a uh, bad or malicious host before the TCP IP connection is even established. So uh, yeah, it started off as a DNS provider in 2006. In 2007, they added filtering and blocking features, uh, added some business specific offerings in 2009, uh, and then they created the Umbrella Suite in 2012, added uh, Umbrella Investigate feature in 2013, and was acquired by Cisco in uh, August of 2015. Um, and then the later slide, there's uh, a few more kind of uh, pertinent dates for, for how uh, some additional features were added, but we'll, I'll kind of get to that a little bit later. Okay, so to, uh, to start off, uh, what is uh, DNS? So DNS stands for uh, Domain Name System. Uh, so pretty much the first step, well, a long time ago, uh, people much smarter than me uh, realized that having IP addresses as your identifiers for uh, for things in the public internet is just not uh, easy to, to use. So uh, the domain name system kind of simplifies that instead of having to learn um, some set of numbers uh, that may change that identifies like a server or host on the internet. Uh, all you need to do now is remember a a domain name. And what that became, uh, came a system to pretty much uh, take a domain name and to uh, parse that out into an actual IP address that would use for your actual TCP IP connection. Uh, so DNS is the first step in pretty much usually any connection. Um, it's just much more convenient for for people to, to use uh, google.com versus whatever public IP address that Google has. Uh, so because it's the first step in connection for any any internet-based uh, traffic that you know a client or a server or a host or anything might generate, it will be the initial step and will proceed pretty much everything else. Um, it'll proceed your TCP IP connection being established. It'll proceed any sort of data transfer, um, any file download or execution, and it's pretty much used by every single uh, device, browser, or application. And it's port agnostic because it's not an application that relies on a specific port. It's pretty much a, uh, a protocol that precedes uh, the actual uh, data connection. <laughs> All right, so uh, where does Umbrella fit as far as security? So because Umbrella is a DNS provider, uh, it can actually take DNS requests that it receives either um, through the its public DNS server or if you have an on-prem device that can kind of do DNS forwarding, it'll take those DNS requests and it can selectively choose whether or not to actually reply with the actual IP, or if it wants to redirect you to uh, like a block page or like a safe page and not to the actual website. So because Umbrella is acting as your DNS provider, it's the first line of defense whenever you try to make a connection out um, and can kind of stop a lot of those malicious uh, connections from even, <laughs> excuse me, uh, from even getting started. So it can block malware before it hits the enterprise, 
uh, it can contain malware that tries to talk to a known uh, command control server uh, because those often use DNS. So it can block those uh, DNS requests from resolving, so block malware from even talking out. Um, Umbrella itself has done a lot of statistics and testing to make sure that its responsiveness is uh, is much faster than your even your like your local ISP DNS. So generally, it may even improve your access to the internet, not necessarily your your actual speed. And because of the um, kind of components that it uses for uh, DNS security for Umbrella, you can provision it. Uh, in in minutes to your your environment, and this is specific to the DNS security portion. Yeah, so uh, if you look at the diagram, it kind of shows you that you know even if you have a next generation firewall um, that you're kind of going through, or like a, a router uh, device, or or you're on like a roaming device going out to the internet, uh, Umbrella can protect kind of all of those different devices because it's not uh, an actual kind of uh, appliance necessarily that has to kind of service any specific location or or uh, application or, or anything like that. Uh, so this is I tried to look up some update statistics, but um, I wasn't able to find any. So these are probably kind of largely out of date. But even when the I kind of pulled these numbers up initially, um, you can see how kind of large Umbrella's view of the internet is. So, part of the reason uh, Umbrella and because now the part of Cisco uh, Talos is so effective is just the uh, breadth of data that they can consume. <laughs> so, uh, so, a lot of things with uh, detection and uh, mitigations of, of threats is you have to be able to kind of see a threat to be able to uh, identify it and then produce uh, protections against it. So uh, Umbrella and Talos, uh, just by virtue of being part of such kind of large uh, global organizations, it ingests just kind of a lot of that traffic, a lot of information, so that they can um, find uh, and mitigate and react to threats much faster than, than a smaller organization would be able to. Excuse me. All right. Okay, so uh, this is just kind of a breakdown of where uh, the different kind of layers of umbrella is part of kind of lies. It's part of the DNS and, and IP layer uh, umbrella with Talos and partner feeds. And also you can kind of tailor umbrella for custom domain lists or custom destinations um, to allow block or, or proxy uh, the proxying is kind of dependent on on uh, how you are using Umbrella, um, but it can kind of allow you to choose how to treat certain types of, of traffic. And then once it gets past Umbrella, um, that's when it kind of goes through the, the normal um, normal protections, like your, your firewall or your router, um, and then also maybe your antivirus and your anti-malware as, as the connection actually does, does complete. Okay, so this is a little more information about how Umbrella gets its intelligence. Um, so part of how Umbrella can identify malicious threats is uh, because they are part of Cisco, they have access to uh, Talos's feed of malicious domains. And Talos is um, the largest kind of threat intelligence uh, organization in the world. So they would be able to just in general see a lot more threats um, and to uh, investigate and find uh, all of the interconnected domains faster than like a, a another organization. Uh, Cisco Threat Grid, uh, which is the kind of the sandboxing platform that Cisco has, um, also just goes through like uh, so many samples daily they can also kind of see and identify uh, malicious domains coming up. And then Umbrella itself as a DNS provider, 
um, that works for kind of all of the umbrella customers, but also for anyone just using open DNS or umbrella as their, their public DNS forwarder, it just sees uh, so many requests per day that it can generate kind of models to identify uh, malicious domains or malicious threats before uh, they even necessarily uh, act maliciously. Um, as part of that, it's because with all this new information, uh, they're able to create models to identify uh, malware, ransomware, um, and then as they get more data, those models become more sophisticated and smarter. Uh, and as the models get smarter, they're able to identify malware and ransomware even more quickly. And then finally, there's the uh, the actual security researcher portion, which is kind of the all of the the super smart cybersecurity people that that Talos employs that uh, can build their own models and also refine the models, not just based off of data, but but just off of kind of new uh, emerging technologies, just uh, just to make those models work much much better. Uh, so these are at least uh, some of the statistical models that Umbrella uses. Um, there's a uh, guilt by inference. So this kind of uh, what that refers to is if you can kind of infer uh, whether or not a domain is good by either how it's kind of being presented um, or how it's co-occurring with other uh, other domains that are known malicious. So if you have a kind of a known malicious domain, and you see that whenever you get like a, a spike in uh, DNS requests for that domain, you also see like a spike in DNS requests for this other domain. You can kind of uh, see that they're kind of uh, spiking together, and then you can kind of infer that the other domain may be may be also malicious. Uh, there is guilt by association, um, just based off predictive IP space modeling. Um, Pass the DNS and who is correlation. So, you know, if you can associate uh, two domains together and one domain is known malicious, that'll help you, you know, kind of identify this new domain that's maybe being used by either the same people or, or seem to be occupying some sort of like the same space. You can uh, predict that maybe that domain is maybe not malicious now, but maybe maybe uh, turning malicious in the in the near future. And then uh, just by uh, patterns of guilt. Uh, you can look at uh, spike rank modeling, uh, how different uh, uh, DNS requests uh, spike. Um, maybe it's, uh, if you see like a malicious domain or malware spiking, and then shortly after you see another uh, domain spiking, you can kind of use modeling to determine uh, if it within like certain parameters of that, that other domain is is malicious or not. Um, then going down, there's a little bit more information about uh, those different models. Yeah, so um, in this example, x.com is a known malicious domain. And when you see uh, domains uh, pop up that are no malicious and they seem to uh, request another domain uh, within a short time frame of each other, you kind of can infer that those two are associated. So uh, even though they're not malicious now, uh, you can at least uh, infer that it's possibly malicious or may turn malicious in the, the future. Uh, this is just an example of the spike rank model. Um, if you look at uh, how the DNS request is spiking for this specific uh, domain, and you kind of have already models built out for kind of known types of uh, maybe malware or ransomware, um, if it kind of hits uh, a similar model or pattern, you can uh, infer that that domain is is the, that same type of, of malware exploit or, or ransomware. And then uh, predictive IP space monitoring. This is just um, if you can look at IP addresses and see things that are uh, either hosted on uh, the same server or hosted on the same subnet or the same block, um, you can, uh, correlate those two IPs and domains together and then use that in um, in the modeling for, for malicious domains. Uh, DNS tunneling. So this is not not super new, but um, is something a little bit newer that, that Umbrella has added as a feature into their, um, just their DNS security portion. 
Uh, so DNS traffic uh, for most organizations, they allow uh, outbound DNS um, freely. They don't do any blocking. They don't, don't do any filtering. Um, the general recommendation would be, you know, if you have an internal DNS server, only that DNS server should be uh, talking out to uh, your uh, public DNS forwarders. But uh, because there are like IoT devices that may be using like just common public DNS servers, or um, people tend to kind of uh, configure things and maybe don't follow a standard. Uh, for most places that I've seen, they don't necessarily have outbound uh, protections to to stop or block any sort of DNS. Uh, so what that has led to is companies actually using, sorry, not companies, uh, malicious actors actually using DNS as a uh, as a way to um, covertly pass uh, either data, uh, command control instructions, uh, just anything to bypass uh, the firewall that would normally kind of block that type of traffic. So although you may see things going out and on, maybe on your firewall when you monitor, it just says like this person was talking to um, this server on port 53. Uh, so you assume it's DNS. Um, if you kind of delve down, down into it and actually inspect it, you'll see that it's not DNS. They're actually doing something maybe malicious. Uh, so this is an example of DNS tunneling. So, um, you know, uh, malware with a uh, tunneling client maybe gets the username and password and then is able to pass that through uh, a your internal DNS server uh, with a kind of carefully crafted uh, DNS request that contains that username and password information. So because, you know, um, this, you know, uh, this server or this domain isn't well known, the recursive DNS has to do recursive lookups uh, to eventually get to that authoritative DNS server for that domain. Uh, and then once that authoritative DNS server actually receives that DNS request, uh, what it turns out is that DNS request wasn't actually uh, somebody trying to, you know, resolve like a website. That DNS request itself actually contained um, just an encrypted version of that username and password. So it's a way for that mal malware with the tunneling client to be able to pass off information and data all the way to uh, to a server out on the internet and bypass maybe any any uh, firewall protections that would have normally caught that. Uh, so the way that um, kind of umbrella is fighting against that is one, we are able to kind of see a lot of requests. Um, those types of DNS requests also generally don't uh, follow any uh, specific um, pattern just because they do have to kind of encrypt data into the actual request itself. Uh, so uh, Umbrella is able to kind of identify domains that are used for DNS tunneling and also add those to your existing like DNS protection to to block those uh, DNS tunneling requests from being able to get sent out. Okay, so this is uh, kind of the older feature list for, for Umbrella. Uh, it can protect you on or off network. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit in the deployment types. Uh, it can stop connections based on 80 plus content categories. Uh, that's part of its kind of its content filtering. Um, which hopefully we'll be able to get to in the, the demo. Um, it can do uh, policies and um, do enforcement based off of uh, active directory groups through its AD integration. Uh, depending on the agent, um, you are able to proxy risky traffic. Uh, it can do some, uh, the IP layer enforcement, actually, I believe that's not, uh, that's not um, supported any longer, so that you can kind of ignore. Um, you can have reporting in the, the cloud, so you can access your, your uh, uh, cloud portal from, from uh, any location and be able to see kind of what's being blocked, uh, what sort of requests are going out, um, and things like that. Uh, you can do log retention via Amazon S3, and then with the log retention um, and the integrations to other, like maybe SIMs or other devices, you can ingest those, those uh, umbrella logs into your uh, other security tools. Uh, Third-party device integrations, uh, threat enforcement integrations. Um, if you are 
part of a MSP, or maybe if your specific company has some needs to kind of uh, separate out companies, you can do a multi-organizational console in Umbrella. And then you can also use Umbrella to do kind of a, a deeper investigation into specific domains and and uh, that people are, are accessing. And then cloud application discovery and control for uh, if you're worried about shadow IT or maybe people in your organization maybe using uh, applications uh, that aren't necessarily allowed um, because yeah, Umbrella is part of DNS and even those uh, third-party applications or shadow IT applications that people are using that they shouldn't be, those still use DNS. So Umbrella will still be able to kind of see all those, even though if you're on like a an older, uh, if you're on like a firewall, it, it might, if it's not um, application aware, it might just list those as like web traffic instead of specific application. So uh, you can see those in, in, in Umbrella also. Okay. Uh, so this uh, is not Michael. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Michael. I just have a quick question. Uh, you you probably addressed that, but uh, so in, if if you want to compare Umbrella with uh, uh, Layer Seven Firewall, so you said that the Layer Seven Firewall can recognize that the DNS traffic, but it cannot recognize that it's a uh, like a bad DNS traffic, and that's the differentiation between the two cons. Or did I understood it correctly? Or so, uh, so Umbrella. At least this portion of the presentation for Umbrella is specific to just kind of a DNS specific. So, so Umbrella is deployed either as like a, a forwarder. This will kind of become apparent in some of the deployment types, but uh, you either use it as like kind of your public DNS forwarder. Uh, if you have like an internal DNS server, you say anything not internal, send all those requests out to uh, Umbrella in the in the cloud, and Umbrella can take those uh, domain name DNS requests and then send back uh, the public IP information to your internal DNS, um, or connect kind of internally as like an application. But it doesn't, at least for this DNS security portion, it's not acting as like a, a firewall itself. So the way that the uh, Umbrella identifies applications is most applications, they have like specific domain names that are associated with them. Uh, so as Umbrella gets those DNS requests, it can identify maybe who's trying to get to uh, to what application just by those domain name requests. Like a, a, an edge firewall that you might have on your network, uh, what it has to do to identify applications is usually, um, depending on kind of what kind of profile it has for the application, it may have to uh, inspect or identify some parts of that traffic. Uh, maybe maybe it's looking at the, the actual uh, destination IP address or or some other um, header that's actually in the traffic itself, and having to do um, like application layer inspection just to identify those uh, those applications. And if you have rules specific to applications, uh, enforce them that way. So uh umbrella is kind of identifying applications by associated domains um your firewall is probably actually inspecting traffic as it passes through and if it's application aware uh it's maybe able to identify the applications that way by actually inspecting those those packets i don't know if that answered your question yes it did thank you okay you're welcome that. you're welcome okay uh so going over a little bit of the deployment types for uh for Umbrella DNS security. Uh, these are kind of just some of the symbols that we're gonna be using. Um, so uh, protection for network devices via DNS server. So this is kind of the, the easiest way to just get uh, Umbrella DNS security just up and running in your, in your environment. If you don't have a specific policy that you want to enforce per user, uh, if you just wanna have everyone kind of uh, just basic uh, default uh, DNS policy and security policies, this is the pretty much the easiest way. You take your internal DNS server that all of your internal devices should be using, and then you configure so that it points to uh, uh, Umbrella in the cloud as its DNS forwarder. So anything that's not internal domain, uh, your internal DNS server will send out to Umbrella to, to resolve. Um, and then usually as a part of the step on the uh, internet gateway, you configure to only allow DNS requests from that internal DNS server outbound. So you're not letting anything else uh, do DNS requests out. So somebody can't just change their local DNS to like 8.8.8 .8 .8 
and be able to uh, resolve like uh, public websites. They all have to go through your internal DNS server, which means they all have to go to Umbrella. And Umbrella in the cloud is doing the actual policy uh, based off DNS request that it's getting. So if somebody's trying to get to like a, a website that they shouldn't be trying to get to, it'll go to your internal DNS server. Your internal DNS sends it to Umbrella. Umbrella says you shouldn't be going to the site and it'll send back like an IP address of a block page instead of the actual IP address that that domain name is, is connected to. All right, okay, so this is the, uh, the next uh, deployment type for uh, Umbrella DNS. Uh, so in this uh, example, you have an Umbrella virtual appliance that is uh, running internally. That Umbrella virtual appliance is actually acting as your <laughs> internal uh, DNS server. So uh, you, you know, either update DCP, but you pretty much update all of your internal devices to to use your Umbrella Virtual Appliance as its uh, local DNS. Uh, the Umbrella Virtual Appliance is uh, configured from the cloud to identify your, your internal domains, uh, and your Umbrella Virtual Appliance also knows what your internal DNS server is internally. So um, the laptop, say it's trying to get to uh, you know, uh, office.acme.com, it'll send a DNS request for that to the, uh, the Umbrella VA. Uh, the Umbrella VA is, is aware of your internal domains. So for that request, instead of sending that to the Umbrella in the cloud, it'll send that to your uh, internal DNS server. And then your internal DNS server will just give back the actual IP address uh, locally. And then the Umbrella VA will send that back to the, uh, the laptop IP. Uh, but if you're trying to go to something that's not one of your internal domains, you know, the, uh, the laptop sends it to Umbrella virtual appliance and the virtual appliance sends it up to Umbrella in the cloud, and then the Umbrella in the cloud uh, checks against your policy, sees if that domain is allowed or not allowed, and it will send back either uh, the actual IP address for that domain, or will send back um, like the IP address of a, of a block page. And then uh, the next kind of deployment type for uh, Umbrella DNS is kind of built on the, the previous one uh, with the Umbrella virtual appliance, uh, except you have the component that talks to your uh, your Active Directory servers using uh, AD Connector Appliance. And what that uh, lets Umbrella do is now it is able to uh, parse and check uh, login information, uh, Windows events for logons, so it can identify uh, IP addresses to uh, specific AD accounts. So now because you have a correlation between AD accounts and local IP addresses, uh, you can set uh, policies uh, specific to your Active Directory users and groups. Uh, so say um, that laptop IP is uh, being used by the CEO. Uh, it sends a DNS request to the Umbrella Virtual Appliance. Uh, the Umbrella Virtual Appliance uh, sees the laptop IP and knows that laptop IP is associated with the uh, CEO's AD account. Uh, and because it is the CEO's AD account, when that gets sent up to the Umbrella Cloud, it does a specific policy uh, for that CEO instead of like the default policy that's applying to all of your individual users or AD groups. Uh, so in this way, you can kind of tailor specific policies uh, for like different groups in your Active Directory so that maybe some people that require like maybe more open permissions uh, for a job role gets access to more while maybe another group um, has more stringent uh, restrictions just because they're in like maybe a, a, a more uh, vulnerable group. All right, uh, any, any questions so far? Okay, all right. Uh, so this is how uh, the majority, well, this is how Umbrella was uh, kind of built out uh, on the onset when they kind of got to uh, DNS-based securities. So uh, since then, uh, a lot has changed. Uh, a lot of the workforce has kind of shifted to, <laughs> excuse me, uh, remote or work from home, um, kind of uh, with the kind of large explosion in, in kind of uh, ransomware and malware events, uh, the needs for security have, have changed somewhat since what they were originally. Uh, so Umbrella itself has also 
uh, kind of evolved since this initial DNS security portion. Uh, so this is kind of just, uh, 2019 is just kind of when they started integrating more security functions into, into the actual service, uh, but I'll kind of go into, into that in a second. Um, but, uh, so kind of the kind of industry term being uh, passed around a lot is SASE or uh, Secure Access Service Edge. Uh, I believe it was coined by, uh, by Gartner, I think in 2019. Um, yep. Yeah, so so what uh, SASE kind of is, it's uh, kind of converging a lot of your uh, uh, network as a service, mainly uh, portions like SD-WAN, uh, and joining it together with uh, kind of network security as a service. So this kind of falls into uh, uh, CASBs or Cloud Access Security Brokers, uh, maybe Firewall as a Service, uh, Cloud uh, Secure Web Gateways, um, and kind of uh, producing a uh, kind of unified uh, edge, regardless of where uh, a company's workers or branches or or even their HQ might be. Uh, so with that, the functions in Cisco Umbrella have have uh, have been added to. So uh, on the left, you see like DNS layer security, which is pretty much what we were talking about before. Uh, so since then. They've added kind of additional features for the secure web gateway. Um, they have uh, portions of a cloud delivered firewall, and it really should be kind of like a cloud delivered uh, next generation firewall. Um, it has uh, aspects of uh, the cloud access security broker or CASB, um, and then also uh, interactive uh, threat intelligence. And all of that ties into uh, SecureX which is, if you're not familiar, it's um, Cisco's kind of integrated security platform um, that kind of gives you uh, a single pane of glass for multiple security products that are in the, uh, the Cisco uh, portfolio. Okay, so uh, with the changes in what Umbrella can do, um, the capabilities that's, that it has has also uh, increased um, so under visibility, it still does on and off corporate network, uh, but now it's kind of expanded where it's not just able to protect you based off of DNS. It can actually uh, protect your internet and web traffic. Um, you can actually use it to uh, control access to apps or control app traffic as it passes through Umbrella. Um, it is able to uh, protect your devices, whether or not they're uh, remote at somebody's uh, home or home office or in a branch location. It can actually do SSL decryption now uh, because of its increased capabilities. Um, and um, it can still identify a shadow IT, uh, but it can also identify sensitive data that's being transmitted, which is part of the kind of uh, DLP and, and CASB functions that it has now. Uh, protection. So it can still do DNS layer security, but now with the secure web gateway, it can actually inspect web traffic. Uh, and with the cloud delivered firewall, it can do file inspection and sandboxing. Uh, and with CASB, it can do data loss prevention. And because it's kind of expanded from just DNS layer security into uh, kind of a lot of new features, it can actually inspect non web traffic and also has uh, intrusion prevention uh, functions. Uh, control, they're still able to do URL blocking and allow list. Um, it's a little bit different now because there's kind of two different areas where you can, where you can have that set up. Um, because it had uh, firewall capabilities, you can block based off of ports and protocols um, because it's application aware as a firewall also now, you can actually use uh, granular app controls as it passes through. Uh, you can still do content filtering at the DNS level uh, but you can also do content filtering at the kind of the, the web firewall level. Uh, app blocking, you can still do app blocking at the DNS level and on the web firewall level. Um, so it's kind of added a lot of new new functions because now it's not just DNS security, it is uh, multiple different pieces uh, of security. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a an outcome summary of what uh, Cisco Umbrella can do now. So it still does DNS. DNS policies are evaluated first. Uh, any traffic that's allowed uh, is passed on to the 
uh, CDFW. Oh, sorry, I should mention that uh, these are all kind of based off of licensing. So you can still have just DNS security uh, and add um, secure internet gateway and other functions on top of that. But uh, if you're just interested interested in DNS security just on its own and you're not interested in kind of some of the SASE functions, uh, you can still do that. This is kind of more if you're using all of the different uh, aspects of of Umbrella. Yeah, so you still have uh, your DNS level uh, layer security at the beginning. Uh, traffic that's allowed through be passed on to uh, maybe your cloud delivered firewall, um, and that can do IPS uh, in file inspection, uh, traffic inspection like a traditional firewall would do, except it's delivered from the the cloud. Uh, you can have uh, web content filtering because it can act as a secure web gateway, so it can do things like uh, uh, some web proxying and and block traffic based off of of that, and then the uh, the CASB portion uh, can do uh, data loss prevention inspection, so you can uh, prevent data from being exposed or being sent out uh, that shouldn't be, and also control some access to to some of your uh, the cloud applications that you normally normally ha um, would use. All right, uh, so with the new functions, also the way that you connect to uh, Cisco Umbrella for the SASE functions uh, or the secure web gateway functions has has changed or not changed, but um, been added to. Uh, so these are kind of the, the main methods. So for your, your headquarters or your branch, um, if you needed that, uh, that firewall functions or you wanted uh, web functions, you can use an um, IPsec tunnel uh, tunnel your traffic to Umbrella um, for web inspection and firewall uh, policy. Uh, if you're only interested in web only, uh, you can um, deploy proxy chaining or uh, use a uh, a pack file to proxy web traffic to to Umbrella for all of your kind of your end users, so that all of their web traffic gets sent over to uh, to Umbrella's cloud firewall or secure web gateway for for inspection and policy enforcement. Uh, for your roaming clients, so uh, Umbrella used to have its own um, standalone uh, client, um, and slowly they started integrating that with the Cisco AnyConnect. Um, so if you just buy just uh, Umbrella on its own, it actually gives you enablement to download AnyConnect. You don't have VPN functions, but you can use AnyConnect as an agent, and that can actually uh, redirect your web traffic and DNS traffic to Umbrella. So if you're just interested in just protecting your remote workers, your roaming workers with Cisco Umbrella, you can just pop any connect onto their machines and it'll uh, enforce your your uh, your Umbrella policies through any connect, regardless of where that, that device is, is located. And then um, even though you know it's changed, you still have that um, the internal DNS server that you can use to either point to Umbrella or deploy the, the virtual appliance. All right, uh, so for the IPsec tunnel, um, a lot of this is still based off of, at least if you're kind of manually having to do it, um, there's a little bit more functions that kind of go into this, um, but you can just set up IPsec tunnels, use uh, policy-based routing to redirect web traffic or all traffic to uh, Cisco Umbrella, um, and you can set up primary, secondary tunnels, uh, so you have some failover. Uh, if you know if any data center might uh, might go offline for for whatever reason, uh, but um, mainly, what kind of uh, SASE is kind of meant to do is integrate um, SD WAN into your your network security. So although this is kind of an option, um, really what you should be kind of maybe looking into is is uh, having SD-WAN integrated with Cisco Umbrella, so it can automatically kind of do all of those, uh, um, bring up all of those tunnels, redirecting traffic automatically. Uh, so Umbrella for SD-WAN, I, I have to check, I don't know, I don't believe it's full release yet, but um, the plan is eventually that they will have kind of a uh, Meraki, if you're used to Meraki MXs, uh, with auto VPN, have some sort of auto VPN functionality where you can actually talk up and create tunnels to um, to Umbrella 
uh, to deliver kind of all of your your umbrella, uh, your traffic for umbrella that way through just the auto VPN. Um, right now, I believe you still have to do um, like a third party VPN tunnel configuration, uh, but the auto VPN is meant uh, is supposed to be in the pipeline. I don't know exactly when it might be coming out. Um, there's um, an SCVT happening fairly soon where they may um, kind of reveal more information about that. Uh, but yeah, as of right now, I don't know if that's that's full release. So um, if you ask me in, in a few weeks, I may have a, a better answer for you. But yeah, so, uh, but as part of SASE, really you want to use uh, SD-WAN to kind of automate a lot of those um, tunnels and traffic uh, policies automatically. So it can kind of connect to your uh, Cisco umbrella data centers by itself, uh, read their traffic and kind of recover on its own. So even if something happens to go wrong in one location um, with SD-WAN, it should be able to kind of redirect and, and connect at another location, even bypass your traffic to another location, depending on maybe how your SD-WAN is, is designed. But it's meant to make it a little bit more, more hands-off, uh, less manual configurations, and be more kind of resilient to to failure, which is kind of the goal for SD-WAN. This is just adding kind of Cisco umbrella as a as a security feature on top of it. Yep, and this is uh, more I think specific to uh, Viptela with the feature templates to push up to to Cisco umbrella. Uh, this is some of the trade deployment. Uh, this is some of the information about uh, Meraki MX integrations that are planned. And this is just kind of uh, more information about um, how it's all meant to kind of uh, kind of work together. Okay, um, so a little bit about the Cisco security clients, um, which I, I believe is actually the new name for, for AnyConnect. Uh, so with your umbrella subscription, you do have entitlement for to uh, download and install the AnyConnect client. And then you can use that as your um, client for umbrella DNS and also for the secure web gateway service. Uh, and in the demo, I'll kind of show you how that's configured. The secure web gateway is kind of, Essentially, you just pretty much just just toggle the switch in the, the umbrella cloud, and uh, once you do that, all of your roaming clients that are using AnyConnect, all their web traffic will get sent up to to Umbrella for kind of a uh, policy enforcement. So, regardless of where they are, now you don't have to worry about you know now you, you were protecting them with just DNS before, but you're still worried if you know somehow they manage to get uh, bypass that or get to some place that they shouldn't be. With the secure web gateway, now you can actually collect also web traffic from those those roaming users. All right, uh, so this is some information about the Umbrella Secure Web Gateway. Um, so the Secure Web Gateway, um, it's mainly kind of acting somewhat similar to like a, a web proxy uh, in the the cloud. So it's kind of like a cloud delivered uh, web proxy that you can use to, to enforce kind of web specific policies. Um, and the ways you pass traffic onto it, like I mentioned before, is the IPsec client, or sorry, IPsec tunnel, uh, any kind of client, uh, pack files in your browser or proxy chaining in your, your browser. Uh, and these are some of the kinds of the functions that the, the secure web gateway has. Um, and then secure web gateway also has its own Kind of set of content categories they can use to to uh, enforce web filtering or web content filtering uh, that's somewhat separated from your your DNS policies. Uh, and then it can do some uh, file inspection sandboxing, and then has uh, control for uh, lots of software as a service apps. And something a little bit new is uh, Umbrella Remote Browser Isolation, uh, which is for, um, as part of the secure web gateway, what you can actually also do with specific rules is um, have certain traffic uh, get isolated. So what that kind of means is that um, you have rules configured where uh, depending on maybe the type of 
of traffic that uh, somebody using the secure web, game, web gateway might be going to, you maybe still don't want them necessarily to talk to that uh, web server directly. So this actually acts as a um, kind of like a, a front end uh, that actually talks to that web uh, server for you and then your client or uh, your branch or whoever's going through the secure web gateway is actually talking to that that front end instead of the actual uh, web server. So it's kind of adding a layer between that user and the actual internet or website that's, uh, that person's trying to get to. It's kind of a little bit abstract, but it's, it's kind of acting as like a, an additional uh, layer of, of protection. So you're not talking directly to, to possibly malicious uh, sites. And it's kind of, I'll just kind of show this in the, the demo, uh, but it's based off of kind of specific uh, secure web gateway policy rules that you can set. You just set it to isolate uh, and it runs in like a, uh, an isolated browser and not your user's actual browser for the actual uh, connection to the web website. Um, I don't know if I'm explaining that, that correctly. Um, it's, it's kind of a little hard for me to, to wrap my head around. So um, if a person tries to get to a website and there is a, a uh, secure web gateway rule set to isolate that website, instead of talking directly to that website, uh, you're talking to uh, the secure web gateways cloud-based uh, kind of front-end browser, and that browser is actually talking to that website in the back um, and doing some kind of uh, inspection and kind of preventing some things from going through. So that user is not talking to that website directly. It's talking to the secure web gateway, and the secure web gateway is talking to, to that website. I don't know if that made sense, but um, that's kind of in general how that that works all right uh so the, a new function uh cloud delivered firewall uh so this is pretty much uh you are using cisco umbrella as a a firewall in the cloud um so a lot of people are familiar with uh your uh on-prem firewall uh so some people used to have just kind of a beefy firewall at their headquarters um and pretty much all their branch sites sent all their traffic through to the headquarters and it would hit that firewall before it got out to the, the internet. Uh, or maybe they have like uh, branch firewalls at each site um, and things like that. So uh, some of the difficulties with that is that if you are sending everything through through to your, your, your main HQ or data center for access to the internet with a centralized firewall, um, what happens if that, that headquarters site goes down and all of a sudden all of your your other users lose access to the, the internet. Uh, if you had a lot of kind of branch firewalls at every single branch, uh, now your, you know, your team is maybe managing um, one firewall here, one this branch, another firewall at, at, uh, at this branch, uh, and they may have, you know, uh, different rules that need to be applied, uh, or you may not be able to, you know, just use like a default template for, for all of them. Uh, or maybe you don't have like a, a firewall manager, so each one has to be managed kind of individually. Um, and also now that there are, you know, uh, remote workers, you know, um, how are you going to, to protect them? Um, do they all VPN back to your, your main site and then pass through that firewall? Are you letting them get out to the internet directly? So there's a lot of kind of just concerns with having uh, an on-prem based firewall. So the advantage of a cloud-based firewall is that regardless of the uh, the site or location. Um, if you have access to the internet, you can send traffic to that one cloud-based firewall. So you can manage that just um, through just one single dashboard, uh, set all your policies up in just that one dashboard, have it apply to all of your sites. Um, and those sites will never be reliant on any other site uh, for access to the internet or anything like that. Uh, so with the cloud-based firewall, it's pretty similar if you're familiar with uh, just most firewalls. You can set up kind of uh, specific rules. It can be, uh, you know, port-based. Um, it can have specific criteria for source destination. Uh, it'll show you things like uh, like hit count. Well, not hit count necessarily, but like uh, if that rule is actually being used. 
Um, it's you can still have like a hierarchy of rules. So it's kind of like uh, what you would have on your on-prem firewall, just in the in the cloud. And because it is um, application aware, it can still do, uh, can still see what applications are passing through the firewall, and it can still produce uh, rules to block specific applications and, and protocols. All right, now uh, it's a little bit more information about uh, kind of the, the path that follows. Yeah, DNS layer security, first layer or first kind of point of protection. Then uh, if you have all the SIG uh, capabilities, they'll pass to the cloud deliver firewall and then pass to the secure web gateway. Uh, some key use cases, uh, block shadow IT over non-web ports. Uh, so you can stop use of unapproved software as a service apps. Um, specifically allow maybe uh, certain conference apps to be used, but not other conference apps, all passing through your, your firewall. And it's not just DNS based anymore. So you can stop it based off of application, uh, port protocol, uh, things like that. Uh, block insecure applications on non-standard ports. Um, so if something uh, is um, passing through your firewall, but it's not using uh, what would normally be the, the port that it uses, like the example they use is Telnet um, passing over uh, 8080. Uh, so for older traditional firewalls, it would see 8080 just considered maybe web traffic. Uh, but because the cloud deliver firewall can uh, get into applications and does have visibility into into application traffic, it can uh, see that uh, that port, but still know that it's telling it and still be able to block it based off of your rules. Uh, and then block unsanctioned traffic over uh, non-web ports. Um, it's, it says non-web ports, but I think they mean also web ports. So um, because it's application aware, it can uh, identify applications that are maybe running off of uh, ports that are normally used for like web traffic and still be able to identify that this isn't like HTTP or HTTPS traffic. This is application traffic that shouldn't be allowed and it can, it can block it that way. Okay, the umbrella intrusion prevention system. Um, so uh, umbrella does have uh, kind of IPS features also built in because it's kind of a, a acting as kind of a, a national firewall now that you can pass traffic to for, for inspection and enforcement. Uh, it can identify traffic uh, that are, uh, that is being used for, you know, malware, botnets, phishing, and, and block it based off of signatures uh, and threat intelligence that it gets from, from Cisco Talos. And because it's part of Umbrella, now you're managing everything from a, a single dashboard. And then um, if you're somewhat familiar with some of the, um, the Cisco next generation firewalls, so you have options, you can set it to uh, uh, protection mode for the IPS, which means you're actually blocking traffic. Uh, if you're you know, just starting off and you're a little bit wary about blocking things immediately, you can set it to detect. And then uh, they have specific settings for how stringent you want the, the policy to be. Uh, most people, I think generally tend to use like manual security and connectivity, which is kind of in between being very, very secure and being uh, not so secure. And then at the other end, there's uh, connectivity over security, and then there's maximum protection. And these are just some of the, uh, the signature lists. Uh, this is kind of just an example of how, how the application would flow. Uh, I'm going to skip this, uh, CASB functionality. Uh, so general CASB type. So CASB stands for um, Cloud Access Security Broker. Um, generally, it's used for uh, data loss prevention to prevent data from leaking out of your, your network, but it's also used for uh, for protection uh, on your, your cloud applications. Um, so this is just kind of part of the cloud delivered firewall functions that Cisco Umbrella has now. Uh, um, let's see, I think a lot of these are 
kind of controls part of CASB. Um, and like data loss prevention, I think these are fairly standard. So I kind of want to get to uh, really quickly the secure X portion. Um, so Cisco has a new kind of integrated platform uh, called Secure X. Um, so it allows you to um, using either APIs or other integrations kind of lets you centralize a lot of your uh, your security information into a single uh, single cloud-based pane of glass. So it's an easy way that you can get to to kind of see all of your your security data really quickly. Uh, there are some kind of automation portions that are part of it. They call it orchestration that lets you automate some functions like uh, uh, generate maybe if you use uh, WebEx Teams, generate like a, a WebEx message whenever some sort of alert is received um, or something like that. But this really integrates kind of with anything in the Cisco portfolio. Um, it can integrate with AMP, Cisco Umbrella, um, uh, to give you kind of uh, that single pane of glass that everyone's kind of looking for. So you can kind of see all the different alerts in, in a single location, single dashboard. So you can kind of save time on having to, to go and search out different alerts or different uh, security tests that you have to do. And uh, as part of it, it does have a way for you to launch directly into those different uh, different security products if you have to go more in depth and do some digging into each each item, but it's something that I think is kind of used for a lot of people. A lot of people are, are uh, security teams are a little bit um, usually understaffed or at, at at least overworked. So anything that'll kind of you know save them some time where they can kind of see a lot of the information that they need uh, in a single place without having to kind of click and drag and and look into multiple areas, I think is always a plus. So uh, SecureX is, is free. Um, so if you have any kind of Cisco Cisco products, um, I would look into to integrating those. Uh, and if you have multiple Cisco products, I would really look into integrating those just because, yeah, like I said, it's, it simplifies a lot of things. Okay. All right, uh, so that is it for the presentation portion. Um, let me just get into the, the demo. Uh, does anybody have any questions so far? Nope. Okay. Uh, what about how someone might use this for free? Um, so Cisco Umbrella, uh, if you wanted to use uh, just open DNS itself for free um, without any of the policies, it's it's kind of an open free DNS resolver. You could just use it for your public DNS. Uh, if you're interested in actually kind of seeing some of the, the functions or even just testing it out for a little while, they do have a lot of, uh, they do have uh, trials you can set up. Um, and then they have a whole process to get you kind of set up uh, with the trial so you can at least get it uh, up and running very quickly so you can actually test it out during the trial instead of having to spend a lot of time getting it set up. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in just kind of seeing what it is uh, without uh, a specific commitment and money, yeah, you can set up uh, an umbrella trial. You can reach out to me and I can help set that up if you want to kind of just deploy just to see how it works. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is uh, all in dCloud. Uh, so this specific lab is the Cisco Umbrella Studio Lab. Um, if you have access to dCloud and you actually kind of run through this specific lab, it'll actually go through the process of setting up uh, a lot of the uh, Umbrella functions themselves. Uh, so it goes through setting up a remote worker, uh, setting up your some of your policies, uh, even setting up some of the the templating for your branch sites uh, for your SD WAN tunnels to automatically connect to, to Umbrella for for enforcement. So.
Okay, so this is the uh, the umbrella dashboard. Uh, this is kind of where you get just general information about the state of your, your network. Uh, if you kind of scroll down, it'll give you kind of a breakdown for uh, the total number of requests, DNS requests you got, uh, if anything was blocked, um, and then security blocks. Uh, if you have the kind of uh, firewall functions, it'll give you information about sessions, uh, breakdown for IPS, for signatures that it saw, uh, security categories. So these are specific blocks for malware, phishing, command control, or uh, crypto mining. Uh, for more in-depth information, or just for uh, all information, you can go to reporting, and you can go to uh, activity search. And this will show you information about uh, either specific networks that were uh, blocked by DNS. Uh, if you have IPsec tunnels, it can show you information about if something was blocked by IPS or firewall. Uh, if you have uh, Active Directory integration, it can even show you things like the, the username. And if we scroll over to the right, it'll show you uh, destination information, action. We can also kind of uh, just filter everything from, from this side. If you're just interested in just security activity, there's also a, a report just for security activity that show you specific things that, that may have been blocked. Uh, if you're interested in shadow IT, you can go to app discovery and you can actually go through and start uh, flagging certain certain apps uh, as either approved or not approved. Uh, you can see maybe um, risky applications that are kind of going through and just gives you visibility into maybe what some of your, your users are doing in your in your environment. Uh, so uh, if I just go back into the, the overview, so uh, just kind of break down the different options here. So this is all based off of different uh, deployment types that you have. So active networks, uh, this is uh, usually any uh, public networks that you may have uh, pointed to Umbrella. So the way that Umbrella uh, identifies you and assigns your policy is it actually looks at the public IP address that you're presenting when you send up a, a DNS request. Uh, so in this section, you would pretty much uh, just add a network, add in your public IP address that you use. And then now whenever Umbrella gets a DNS request for that public IP address, it knows that that is for your specific organization and it, uh, and it enforces policies using, using that. Uh, so for roaming computers, uh, the way that uh, roaming computers are identified is that uh, you have a either a profile or a uh, client that you directly download from from this dashboard and install onto your your client machines and has your organization information uh, built into the configuration so that when those devices talk out to umbrella it can identify them as part of your uh, your organization and then enforce policies that way and then network tunnels are for people using IPsec tunnels for either the uh, secure web gateway or for the cloud delivered firewalls. So here we have uh, kind of two of the C edges that are uh, using IPsec tunnels to connect up to Umbrella to pass over uh, all traffic so they can go through the cloud delivered firewall and also the, the secure web gateway. Uh, any Any questions so far? Uh, moving on. Uh, so quick next section, uh, domain management. This is how um, Umbrella can identify what domain should be passed over to uh, public uh, Umbrella's public DNS in the cloud versus what should be sent internally to your internal DNS server. 
Uh, so if you have multiple uh, domains, you just enter enter them here. Uh, sites and Active Directory. This is if you want to use um, AD specific policies for groups or users. You would deploy a uh, an AD connector uh, service and also run a script on your domain controllers. Uh, and what that lets uh, Umbrella do is the service will actually talk to your domain controllers and and query for like login events um, and then note the username and then what IP address they logged in from and uses that to uh, identify Active Directory users by IP and then uses the Active Directory user to enforce Active Directory use group or user specific policies. Uh, and then internal networks is you just, you can set up your internal networks here so that they are, um, if you want to do policies based off of internal networks. So if you have a, a subnet for um, accounting versus a subnet for your um, IT staff and you want to have different policies, you can set it uh, internal networks here. Uh, and then once you get to your uh, umbrella virtual appliance, uh, you can use their IP address to enforce specific uh, policies. Uh, and then the policy here itself is kind of the, the big uh, meat of, of Umbrella. Uh, so the policies kind of go in a kind of an order. So DNS policies are first up because they're generally um, enforced first. Uh, so you can have a default policy uh, but then you can also have policy specific to uh, specific identities. Um, so we just click on. Um, actually, let me just edit my existing one. Um, so based off your, your deployment, you can have uh, specific policies for Active Directory computers, uh, you can have policies for uh, for AD groups or AD users. You can have policies for, for uh, different networks or different kind of public IP addresses, so different uh, sites that might be talking up to Umbrella. You can have specific policies for, for roaming computers. Uh, if you're actually using tagging for your different sites, you can have uh, different policies for, for sites. So you can have, uh, you know, very specific policies based off of different criteria that you're using. Um, Security-wise, these are the different security categories. Uh, there's malware, uh, which are kind of no malicious domains. Newly seen domains, these are domains that are just uh, very, very new and haven't been seen before. Um, which have the high likelihood of just being used in like a new attack. Uh, domains for command and control servers, uh, domains commonly used for phishing attacks, uh, sites that use like dynamic DNS content, so uh, um, sites that could be potentially harmful. So these are kind of sites that aren't exhibiting kind of known malicious behavior, but exhibiting kind of suspicious, suspicious behavior. Uh, domains used for DNS tunneling, and domains associated with uh, crypto mining. And then uh, you have content settings here. Uh, you can use pre-built content settings. You can also do custom content settings. So this is separate from the, the web policy. Um, this is just DNS specific only. So if you set up content categories in your DNS and set up different content categories in your web policy, they both get uh, evaluated individually. Yep, and then you can set up specific uh, destination list and then um, final inspection. Uh, go really quickly into the firewall policy. So these are your firewall rules. Uh, so uh, IPS settings are kind of, they don't have, um, IPS settings are just set here instead of like per rule. You can either turn it on or off, set it to uh, detection or protection, uh, set for either uh, connectivity, balanced security over connectivity or maximum 
detection based on how stringent you want your IPS settings to be. Uh, but to add a rule, you just click on add, give a name to the rule, uh, set the order. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a traditional firewall. It goes uh, top down for how they are uh, evaluated. You can allow or block, uh, set up protocols, uh, set up specific uh, sources and ports and destination of the ports and set up a, a schedule and determine whether or not you want to, uh, to log. And then beyond that, you also have a uh, web policy. So this is the web policy is specific to the secure web gateway. Uh, so these are separate from the DNS content filtering policies. This is as web traffic passes through uh, the umbrella in the, the cloud. Uh, so it's kind of similar to what you would expect. Uh, you can set rules here. Uh, so right here is where you can actually do the remote browser isolation. Um, you can also set up uh, rules that just warn somebody if they're trying to get to a, a website. So instead of outright blocking them, you can get them a, a warning that they can kind of click through if they, they do want to get to the site. Uh, and then here you can set up uh, application specific rules. I can set up uh, content categories here for each rule. Uh, and then you can also use, if you have destination lists that are whitelisting certain domains, you can also apply that here. And then uh, your data loss prevention policy, which I'm not going to get into too much. And then you have your different uh, policy components on the left. Uh, so after you kind of configure like everything here, uh, just using this remote workstation as an example. So this is uh, an example of somebody using the uh, AnyConnect module with Umbrella running right there. Uh, depending on the, where your location is, it should tell you if you're protected, unprotected, uh, or disabled. A quick check to see if you're actually being uh, enforced by Umbrella. If you go to welcome.umbrella.com, they'll give you a nice green check mark if Umbrella is actually working. <laughs> uh, but Cisco also does have um, some test websites that you can go to. Yeah. And then this is what general what the block page will look like for uh, for when things are are blocked. And so this is how it would look for a uh, remote uh, remote worker using any connects for like the secure web gateway and also for the uh, um, DNS protection. Oh, sorry. And then for the secure web gateway, I'll show you where that's configured really quickly just to show you how simple it is. So under roaming computers, if you go to settings, it's uh, actually just uh, a little toggle right here. Yeah. So if you toggle this little switch on, all of your roaming computers uh, will get full web proxy protection for internet traffic. So it'll send all of the web traffic to the secure web gateway. Um, and then what does that, it'll use like the, with the web policy enforcement um, along with like the DNS policy enforcement. And then this is just an example of a, uh, a branch worker. Uh, this person is connected to uh, Umbrella through a IPsec tunnel. So they still use kind of your DNS-based policies, but then uh, because it's running through an IPsec tunnel and going to uh, the cloud delivered firewall. 
it should also be running through your IPS as part of the policy. Uh, this, let me try you know window. So if IPS was set up, I should be, yes. Yeah, so I should be getting this, which is um, the connection was, is being reset because I'm passing through the cloud delivered firewall and it has IPS running. So it's actually inspecting that file and, and blocking it based off of uh, off signatures. Uh, that's it for the demo, unless there's something specific you guys were interested in, in seeing in the, in the dashboard or, or on the, uh, specific clients. Uh, Michael, did you say that this, the web page you're displaying now that is customizable? Yeah, so let me go back here. So the umbrella block page, so yeah, so it's not, uh, you don't have to use their, their existing, uh, existing page. You can actually customize it so it has specific text or, or logos. Um, so you can, yeah, so you can add an email address for people to contact. There's some, some of it that's not, you're not able to, um, change it completely, but you can add like your custom messaging. Uh, you can add like, uh, your, your own logo and things like that to it. So it won't be, uh, like a hundred percent that you'd be able to design, but it'll at least, uh, have the text and and some of the other things that you'd want. Got it. Okay. I don't have any questions. I there's only a few people left. I know because we had some problems with WebEx. But um, did anyone have any questions for Michael? Okay. Uh, that should, I think, pretty much wrap it up then. If you do have questions, you can always reach out to me via email and I can put you in touch with Michael. Need help? Call our cybersecurity team and book a consultation with us today.